Okay, so today um, I want to briefly talk about uh, one step that is really critical when analyzing proteomes or metaproteomes. Um, you know, when you do your initial quality check of your data first, you know, of course, you do your summary statistics to see if you have any outliers and what your overall sample quality is. But then another step that can be really critical is to actually run a hierarchical clustering. This is particularly useful if you have um, experiments where you have multiple different conditions and you want to check if you know the samples from different conditions actually all fall together, which they should if um, if the experiment was uh, was done well, it will show you if there's any problems, potential sample switching, things like that. So to do this, um, we use Perseus, um, which is a free software that you um, can can download. It's provided by the people that also developed the software MaxQuant. Uh, so it's the Max Planck Institute uh, in, in Munich. And so um, I'm going to use um, Perseus 2.0 today. Um, but there's many other versions that you could be using um, that do all the same thing. So we'll be using Perseus um, to do the hierarchical clustering. Um, just takes a second to open. And so what you need as the input is some kind of a table that has um, is a tab delimited table that has some kind of identifiers for your proteins and then you know has values. And here in this case, we have, for example, peptide spectral match um, counts for all the different samples, but it could be normalized spectral abundance factors or um, centered log ratio transform data, or what have you, or even AOCs. So some kind of um, quantitative values for all your proteins in a variety of um, <clears throat> samples. Ideally, your um, sample name has some kind of a code in it where that you later can then use to see you know, from which treatment they were and if they fall in, in respective clusters. So now, um, and it has to be a tab delimited file. So you can easily prepare this, for example, with Excel when you just uh, save it as a tab delimited text file. Okay, so now what do we do? So we have this file. Um, first thing what you have to do in, in Perseus is you have to import um, this data. So you use a generic matrix upload. Um, this window pops up, you select the file of interest. So in this case, we'll be using this one. This is the file I just showed you. It opens, it will show you all the columns that it has identified. Um, that it has identified all the column names, <clears throat> and then you have to sort them. So the protein accession number you should be putting as a text, so you can use this. And then all the columns that actually contain your values, it's a little tricky because it says numerical here, but that's actually not the right thing. It, you actually place them in main by selecting them all and moving them over, and then you just say, okay. It generates a new matrix, um, you know, and in, in Perseus, you always have these nodes. You here have your matrix here, you know, you have your sample names on the top and then all the values are in here and um, in this case in this version of Perseus any missing values are replaced by NA so uh, non-existent values. Now there's different ways you can do these cl um, hierarchical clusterings you know you can do different transformations and uh, right. I'll show you two ways today but you know you can actually really play around on how you want to do it. So the most simplest if you just have count data what you can do is you have to somehow replace these missing values so you can for example impute them Go to imputation, say uh, replace missing values by a constant. You know, you want to have a value that is smaller than any real value. So we just, for example, can say 0.1 because the lowest count is, of course, 1. So you replace them all and you will see that all the missing values are now replaced with 0 0.1. Um, then we'll do a C-score transformation. Click on the C for C-score transformation. We, um, we just um, basically... Uh, center all the data across the rows um, so it's comparable across the rows and that's it and then you know you immediately can go here to this hierarchical clustering icon and do the hierarchical clustering so in this case we're only interested in seeing how samples cluster by their protein and protein abundance values across samples so we need only the column space tree here you can, of course, you could play around, you know, with different distance matrix, matrices and whatever, and you know, you can do that if your initial clustering stone looks so great. But usually, I just go with the de default, which is a Euclidean um, distance and using the k-means. 
and you know I'll let leave everything as else as the defaults. You run the clustering. <clears throat> it takes a second, and then you just click on this little icon. You can see the clustering. You know you have to move things a little bit around so you can actually see what you're looking at. Right. So you can look at this clustering. You know there's a variety of tools that you can learn of learn 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 about if you go on to the Max Quan Summer School videos you can find on YouTube. So I will not talk about it, but you know, you could clean up this heat map, make it prettier, add different labels, different colors, what have you. So I'm only interested here now in understanding are my samples clustering by their conditions? So basically, are they sorted by the protein expression values? So in this case, the, we actually have multiple different conditions. So for example, one of the main conditions is a stationary phase versus exponential phase. And you can see that exponential phase makes a nice cluster here. and stationary phase uh, makes a nice cluster here. So samples are separating at least by those conditions. Then looking further, you know, here is actually two different um, media types. And again, we see like it separates out in a nice cluster by this T medium versus the L medium. Uh, again, here the same thing. And then we have these subclusters that are actually corresponding to different temperature resonance. So overall, this is an example of when it worked really well. Here, basically, the clustering confirms our samples co-cluster um, with, with, um, with the samples of the same condition, right? So for example, these are all from the T medium at room temperature at stationary phase. Um, you always have to watch out, you know, you're not looking actually at which samples are next to each other. You really have to look at these nodes up here. And so things that are on the same node are clustered together. But for example, here, this sample is not in the same cluster, in the same subcluster, right? It's in a, actually in a different subcluster. So you shouldn't think that these two are in the same. So you really have to look, okay, this is a cluster. And now I look at the samples. And then this is another cluster. I look at the samples. And of course, there's another node higher up. And so these are all also together by the medium condition. So this is a case when it worked out really nicely. There's other things you can, other ways you can do this clustering. I know, for example, if this hadn't worked so nicely, one one thing I would have tried, and now I'm just have to move this back, is um, is for example, we can uh, normalize the data first, right? Because you know, when we have these PSM counts, it's completely unnormalized data; it's just raw counts. We, you know, would replace uh, the missing values again with with imputing the 0 0.1. But then, for example, we could do a centered log ratio transform, which you can do very easily in, in Perseus by um, using the transform function. So first, you do the log um, 2 of all the values very quickly. And then to do it, make a centered log ratio transform, um, you actually have to then subtract the average of the log um, transformed values. So you go to normalization here. You say um, subtract, you choose the mean. You have to choose actually columns. So it's actually because you want to normalize by the columns in this particular case. Say OK. So now it's um, send a log ratio transform data. And then you can, again, you know, just run the hierarchical clustering just on the columns. And there we go. It looks slightly differently. Um, you know, and on top of this, you could, of course, now do a C-score across the rows or whatever. So there's many, many different ways you can experiment here. But both ways should, should work well. Now let's look if this is giving us any different result. And again, we can see very nicely it's separating really nicely into major clusters on the exponential phase, stationary phase. Again, it separates out by the medium type here, L versus T. It separates out into subclusters then by the temperature that this experiment was run at. So again, you know, this is a really, you know, then you would use this data just to confirm, okay, I didn't switch any samples. It all looks good. I can move ahead now with my statistics. Now, um, let me show you what it would look like when it's not ideal. So I'll open a new window here. And I'll load a different file <clears throat> with different values um, where I know that it will uh, look like an example, a good example of, of what potentially does no not look so well. Uh, so loading a different file, again, you have to 
somehow it always automatically puts something into the text field, but we don't like that. We actually need to put the accession number here. In the text field, then, you know, I know these columns contain my values. I move them into main. And then um, I say, okay, it loads the matrix. Now here, these values in this particular case are actually ENSA percentages, so normalized spectral abundance factors expressed as percent. Um, you see a lot of zeros in here, which we potentially have to deal with. So one way um, we could access, access this data, we could again um, do a, you know, we could go straight to a C-score, which might work actually, not try it, let's try. Um, the C-score unfortunately has an issue because it actually generates all these um, non-valid values. So it's better to actually impute before we do the C-score. So for example, we could go and say, um, we could do, a, say, a log transform here. We get all these non-valid values. And we could, well, actually, I have to think for a second. Could we do, let's see. I think, yeah, wait, the C-score wouldn't work. So just let me pause this real quick. Okay, sorry for the, the brief confusion. Okay, so we have loaded this matrix of NSF percent values. So um, one way to deal with them is to first block transform them. And then um, now we have all these uh, non-valid values here that we have to somehow deal with. And one way to impute them really quickly you know, if you want to do statistics, you have to think about your imputation a little more, but just for the purpose of getting a quick hierarchical clustering, it's, we can use, for example, the replace missing values from a normal distribution. Um, we want to do a pretty narrow distribution so we don't create any fake values. And we want to shift down pretty far just so um, we're really staying outside of the range of actual values. And so we now imputed all these uh, missing values. Um, we can then do the C-score again and do a hierarchical clustering. Oh, sorry, that was slightly too quick. I want to not, um, I only want to include the co column tree in this case. So I'll run the column tree and here we go. So you can do multiple different ways. And so this is what the column tree now looks like. Um, okay, so here we have this heat map. Here in this case, the, um, the letters C, V, M, and P actually indicate the condition. And you can immediately see there's something wrong here, right? So, you know, we don't see any clear clusters of just a single condition, right? All the V's don't fall together, all the C's don't fall together. So we have a lot of differences here. And then we actually see that there's these two far removed outliers that are completely separated. And, you know, the red color here, in this case, in this heat map actually indicates that there are very low or no expressed values. So this would actually indicate that likely there were almost no proteins identified in these two particular samples, which, you know, if you do your summary statistics, you would see already um, these two samples don't have many proteins. You would remove them as outliers before actually moving on to this analysis. So that's one way, you know, you, you clearly see some, something is wrong. The samples are not clustering by condition. So here you really have to think about if you can actually go ahead with this experiment or if you have to repeat it, potentially there will some sample switching involved that you have to, to resolve. Now, of course, you know, there's you know, we could think maybe the clustering wasn't optimal. You know, one thing I could think about is that there's a lot of, um, based on this matrix, right, there's a lot of values where, uh, proteins where we have very, very few values. So maybe maybe it would help to pre-filter the data a little bit and see if, um, if maybe with um, a lot of the sparse data removed and only focusing on proteins that actually have a lot of expression value, uh, Expression values, uh, we see something different. So, right, so we could go to our matrix here where we um, did the log transform, and then we could do some filtering 
by um, row, just filter out by valid values. So we could say we want to have only proteins that have at least, you know, say four valid values. Um, we could remove them. So, you know, in the original matrix, we had 8,800 proteins. Now we filter a little bit. Now we only have around 4,000 proteins left. So m many more proteins that actually have valid values. And so then we would go, we have to do again the imputation step here. We cannot forego that because we still have some columns with non-values. And so impute. Then again, hierarchical clustering. Just here, we only need a column tree to see how samples cluster. And now let's see if this somehow improves the situation. It looks it looks slightly different, but we still have these two strong outliers that basically have no expression. And again, you know, samples, you know, here on a V sample falls with an M sample. We have a cluster cluster down here that is V, M, and C. Um so really uh the samples are not clustering by condition and so this is a problem you know we would then have to consider and so moving ahead with data as analysis and statistics would be a problem in, in such a case you really want to see what we saw in the first first time around okay with that um thank you for your attention and i'll stop the recording now <laughs>